Green light. Um, so I'm here to talk about reclamation and mitigation to some extent. Um, I'm going to focus my talk on the reclamation side on the oil sands, um, since that's what I know most about. Um, I will um, I will start off with the mineable oil sands and then move on to the in situ side. So there are currently eight active surface oil sand mines um, operating in northern Alberta under four different companies, Suncor, Syncrude, Canadian Natural, and Imperial. Um, all of them use the same extraction process. I'll just give you a quick primer. Um, these are uh, open pit mines. They use truck and shovel to excavate the bituminous sand, which then are transported to an extraction plant where the bitumen is separated from the sand using the Clark hot water extraction process. Just a tidbit, um, that process was invented back in 1929 by uh, Dr. Carl Clark, who was a scientist with Alberta Research Council. And now Alberta Research Council or in Otec, Alberta is located on uh, Carl Clark Road, just uh, south of the city here. Anyways, um, so in 2020, uh, mined bitumen accounted for about 50% of the total bitumen production in Alberta. Um, as a byproduct of bitumen extraction, uh, we get tailings and oil sand processed water as alluded to by Dr. Uh, Sogat Chang's presentation. Um, tailings are a mixture of sand, clay, silt, water, residual bitumen and other hydrocarbons, salt and trace metal. Um, oil sand processed water, OSBW, um, are essentially the free water in tailings ponds that contains less than 5% solid. OSPW has the same chemical profile as the tailings. Um, in addition, it also contains dissolved organic components such as uh, naphthenic acids, um, phenols, and PDHs. Tailing ponds act uh, kind of like a holding area in which water can be removed and recycled um, for continuous extraction. And it also acts as a settling basin to separate the water from the tailings. So they can be out of pit, like the one in this diagram, or an in pit structure, like the one in this picture. Um, so the issue with tailings is that it's going to continually grow as extraction um, continues in the province. Um, as of 2020, there's about 1.36 billion meters cubes of total fluid tailings. Um, the tailing ponds cover an area of 257 kilometers square. Uh, that's about roughly twice the size of Red Deer. Um, like I mentioned, the growth is expected until 2030 uh, at about 1.7 billion meter cube, at which time that's the end of mine life for Syncrude. Um, and this equates to about 680,000 Olympic size swimming pools. So this diagram on the right kind of highlights the production of tailings um, on a volume basis for each of the mines. So what is the objective for uh, reclaiming tailings and oil sand processed water? Well, the tailings is uh, managed under the framework, uh, the tailings management framework, which stipulates that any new fluid tailings from a project must be ready to reclaim 10 years after the end of mine life whereas all the legacy tailings must be ready to reclaim by the end of mine life. So fluid tailings are considered ready to reclaim when they've been processed with an acceptable technology, placed in their final landscape position and meet the performance criteria developed based on that deposit. Um, generally speaking, ready to reclaim tailings will be integrated into one of two different types of closure landform. Uh, and pit lake, like the one on your top right, or a terrestrial landform, um, like the one on the bottom right. Baseline Lake in Syncru is one of the first end pit lake commissioned about 10 years ago. Um, it's a roughly about 800 hectare in size, contains about 45 meter uh, fluid tailings with capped with five meters of water. All oil sand companies have proposed end pit lake in their mine closure plans, but it's still currently too early to know if Mpit Lake 
is an effective reclamation strategy for tailings, um, which means the other option is to cap tailings with sand or overburn material to create terrestrial landform. And then you, in order to do that, uh, to place a cap on the tailings, the deposits have to be trafficable. Um, and that's a huge challenge. Um, how do you consolidate tailings to make them trafficable? Generally speaking, uh, you require some type of active treatment and time. Um, some of the treatment technologies that are currently used by companies include um, using adding polymers or some kind of coagulants to enhance clay flocculation. Um, some type of co-deposition, uh, mixing fluid tailings with uh, sodic overburden or centrifugation. Um, on this table here, you'll see that um, multiple treatment technologies are utilized at each mine. Um, there's still currently a lot of uncertainties in terms of treatment efficacy and deposit performance over time. There's a lot uh, that we don't know about how polymers may degrade over time and whether or not that deposit will stay cohesive. There's still a lot of research required in terms of capping these deposits, um, how do we do it, what materials we use, and whether or not these deposits are able to support target ecocytes. Um, moving on to oil sand process water. So currently, um, most com all companies are under a zero discharge practice, and it has been since um, the mine first started. Uh, that means no water is released under this practice, and currently there is no water release criteria or policy in place. Um, in this article on your right, as alluded to, um, published in, by CBC um, back in December 2021, um, this, this water release criteria is coming. Um, we, the companies are moving towards treatment. Um, and mainly to target um, reduction in toxicity associated with naphthenic acids. Um, treatment uh, ranges from using very high energy active technologies um, traditionally used in water treatment plants, adding coagulants, sedimentation, filtration uh, to absorption and oxidation all the way to the spectrum of passive, low energy, nature-based solutions, such as constructed treatment wetlands. Um, moving on to the in situ oil sands, 80% um, of Alberta's oil sand deposits are actually too deep for open pit mining. So instead they're extracted in situ using SEGD or steam assisted gravity drainage. So there are currently 31 active SEGD projects in the province, accounting for about 38% of the total bitumen production. Uh, again, a quick primer on the whole SEGD process. It involves drilling a pair of one kilometer long horizontal well, one that sits about five meter on top of the other. Water, which usually are saline, are heated to become steam. And then it travels through pipeline and injected into the upper well. The steam heats up the bitumen, allows it to flow by gravity into the producing well below. And the result oil and condensed steam emulsion is then piped from the producing well to the plant nearby, which then is separated and treated. Generally, the produced water is recycled to generate new steam. Again, it's a very energy intensive process. Uh, it requires about 2.6 barrel of steam for every barrel of bitumen produced. In addition to that, um, seismic lines are created uh, to locate bitumen deposits. So this is probably the largest disturbance from in situ oil sand mining. Um, so seismic lines, for those of you who don't know, are these narrow clearings cut through the forest to provide access for seismic exploration equipment, um, like I said, to use to locate bitumen deposits. Um, companies are not required to reclaim seismic lines. And so since the 1950s to the early 2000s, these conventional seismic lines ranging from five to 10 meter in width are um, cut all across the province. Um, recovery on these seismic lines are very slow and inconsistent. 
Um, typically, these disturbances from decades of exploration activity are still persisting on the landscape today, as you can see in the pictures. And on um, the diagram on your right is a photo from ABMI showing the extensive footprint of seismic line on Alberta's landscape. Uh, in some areas, seismic lines can reach a density up to 40 kilometers per kilometer square. So what are the impacts of seismic lines? Um, like I mentioned, trees reestablish very slowly on seismic lines due to various reasons such as compaction, competition, low light availability, and repeated line use. And there's also issues with topography and terrain wetness. Um, and also creates environmental impacts on permafrost, hydrology, and carbon storage. Um, and one of the bigger impact of seismic line is the large scale fragmentation of the landscape, which have found to affect wildlife habitat use and predator prey dynamics. Um, we know through research that seismic line facilitates the movement of wolves, resulting in an increased predation of the threatened woodland caribou. Um, so, as Dr. Chen mentioned, uh, there's about 1.8 million kilometer seismic lines in Alberta, and about 250,000 of those are within caribou ranges. So, how do we restore a seismic line? And does it even work? <laughs> um, the government of Alberta actually drafted this framework to kind of guide the restoration of legacy seismic lines, uh, I think back in 2018. Um, and it's mostly focused on caribou habitats with the overarching goal of stabilizing and recovering the caribou population. This framework suggests applying restoration treatments such as site prep, mounding, ripping, tree planting, and the use of woody material to create microsites as well as to reduce access. Um, there's also more and more forestry companies including seismic lines as part of their reforestation plans so when they harvest from a cut block that will include a lot of the seismic lines, lines nearby in their um, restoration or reforestation plan. Um, but seismic line re restoration is not cheap and it's not easy. Um, it costs about $10,000 per kilometer. Um, and it's also hard to know if it's effective. Um, just because you plant a tree on the seismic line, it doesn't mean it's going to grow. And to mitigate the impact of seismic lines, um, the province has offered a financial incentive to companies to reduce the width of seismic lines. So the 2D seismic lines or the conventional seismic lines, which range from 10 to 5 to 10 meters width, um, were phased out in the early 2000s and then replaced them with the 3D or the 4D seismic lines there slightly narrower, uh, ranging from 1 to 1.5 meter in width. Um, so there's less disturbance on the landscape using these new technologies. And as well, the province came out with a draft woodland caribou range plan, which aims to achieve 65% undisturbed habitat in the caribou ranges. So they've invested money to create 1.6 million hectares of new provincial parks, as well as um, investing in $85 million to restore seismic lines in the caribou habitat. Um, most oil sand companies are motivated to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions for one reason or another. Um, and one of them is the Technology Innovation Emission Reduction Regulation, which regulates large emitters to reduce their greenhouse gas emission intensity by 10% compared to their average emission between 2016 to 2018. Um, so for a lot of these vertically integrated oil sand companies that have assets both in the mineable and the in situ oil sands, um, it's easy to find greenhouse gas mitigation solutions. Um, in both the midstream and the downstream process. So the diagram on the left is actually from um, Suncor, and that's their um, greenhouse gas re emission reduction target, and it highlights how they're going to achieve that. And the figure on your right is actually from uh, CNRL, or Canadian Natural. Um, 
discussing how they plan to reduce their greenhouse gas emission. Um, again, a lot of these solutions comes from their midstream downstream process and not a whole lot from the upstream process. So um, I think that's all I have today for you. Thanks.